This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so good to be with you again. I'm Ido Aharoni, your host, and I'm so happy that we have with us Dr. Miri Talmon. Hi. A person good who, good morning, it's a person who devoted her entire professional career to the study of culture and particularly Israeli popular culture. And she's also a lecturer at the film school. And she writes a lot about movies and te- television shows. And so before we talk about what is popular culture, culture and specifically what makes Israeli popular culture unique. Let's talk about you a little bit. So you told me before we started the broadcast that um, you actually studied at Tel Aviv University way yes, back then. I, so tell us about that. So uh, my first and second degrees, I studied at Tel Aviv University. I studied applied linguistics and English literature. And then I studied for my master's, I studied English. literature and for my PhD I did my degree at the the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in communication and journalism so that was the special program with the um Elihu Katz and yes. uh, Ruth Liebes and all, yeah. Yes, Tamar Liebes was... I'm sorry, Tamar Liebes, yes. yes. She also taught here at Tel Aviv U at, at some point. Uh, I remember taking a few classes with her. Yes. So She's you have such an eclectic my background. my teacher and my rabbi. <laughs> so you had such an eclectic background. Uh, applied linguistics, English literature, mass communications, really perfect background to become a scholar who studies culture. Exactly. And This so, is the thing about culture, that it's everything. It's everything, exactly. And, and when we define a certain social phenomenon as a cultural phenomenon, it means that it has some defining characteristics. What would you say were the main characteristics of Israeli popular culture that attracted you? Um, my dissertation... was uh, titled Nostalgia, Groups, and Collective Identity in Israeli Cinema. And what I studied particularly were two phenomena. One was groups, or what we call in Hebrew, Hevri. So um, Hebrew, Israeli culture is, is very much characterized by the need to be together, the need for solidarity, And what the scholar of Israeli culture, Tamar Katriel, describes uh, as the ethos of cohesion. Because we're an immigrant culture and because we absorb many cultures, the, the, first of all, I think the creation of culture, Hebrew culture, uniquely Israeli culture, is a miracle. And it's the most important thing about Israel. Right. Without, so without what, what, what you're saying is that basically the creation of what we call in Hebrew, mamlachtiut, statism, which was Ben-Gurion's main flag, right? So it required uh, creating new content to Jewish holidays, uh, required the creation of new popular culture, either through literature, through music, and through films. And the collective was at the center. People were measured and judged by their contribution to the collective and not by their individual achievement. Well, here is the thing. The, this began long before the state. And this state wouldn't exist if there wasn't this thing that was created here, that created Israeli identity and... Israeli symbols, Israeli practices. Culture is not only the high holidays and the symbols. This is extremely important. But what's important as well are everyday practices. Actually, culture is life. That's what it is. Right. Fashion, commercials, proverbs, jokes, so, Israeli humor. So describe the moment that you decided that this is going to be it. This is what you're going to be studying. 
Well, I owe this to uh, my dear teacher, Professor Ishayao Nir, with the department. He was then the chair of the Department of Communication at the Hebrew University. And after, when I did my master's thesis, my teacher, Nurit Gertz, uh, actually asked me to work with her. Uh, the Open University of Israel just started, and I was really inspired and, and enthusiastic about meeting Israelis from all over. The, the Open University, by nature, is multicultural and, very, and, and actually enhances access to Israelis in the margins as well, in the periphery, to academic education without gatekeeping. Actually, it's open to everybody. And so then I, I actually started my academic career and I went to the Hebrew University to Professor Nir and I said to him that I decided to do my PhD. And uh, it, originally I thought I would write about American cinema. And then he said to me, why don't you research your own culture? I see you, that you're very much into it. And, and so that's what did it. Because for me, um, scholarship, research, teaching, and teaching is the soul of, of, of my academic career. I love teaching. And I taught not only in Israel, I taught for over a decade in the United States. And um, to me, it feels that when you teach about culture and when you study culture, it's you, you study about not only the real thing, but let me quote someone. It's a, a, a scholar of a, the book that he wrote. Uh, James Carey is titled Communication is Culture. And what he says is media or communication is not only transferring information and knowledge over space, it's communication over time from generation to generation. It's like when you yeah. when it's you so come to story television. Yeah, story yes, telling. It's like you come to church. It's like you come to the Agora, to a city council. Right, right. Now, let's talk about this term you mentioned. There's such a unique Israeli concept called chevre. Um, so many... Um, diaspora Jews that are listening to us right now are familiar with the word chavruta, which is a word that is being used in synagogues throughout North America and English-speaking uh, countries to describe uh, a study group. So it's a group that comes together. We know the word kumzitz, which means in Yiddish, come sit around a bonfire, right? So that's part of the concept of chavruta, of a group. And so tell us about the word chevre. And what's the role and the place of Hevre, the group, the camaraderie in Israeli popular culture? So, first of all, you know, as an expatriate in, in living in the United States for over a, a decade, there were always chavurot there of Israelis who formed their groups and, and um, kept this closely knit solidarity and camaraderie and, and hanging out together. I think um, it's unique in Israel because of the fact that, you know, if you ask people to go, for example, and sacrifice their lives for their country, there need to be something very, very strong to bind them together. And so um, this ethos of cohesion, gibush, which has for its metaphor uh, the, the crystal, the crystallization is the metaphor for what Israeli culture strives for. Uh, and or at this least is used to strive for. Used to strive for <laughs> exactly, uh, but I don't think it's over because if it when it is over. What's the hope? I mean, this is the thing that keeps uh, Israeliness 
uh, strong and real. The thing is, uh, this is an immigrant culture. There are many who came from many different cultures. In the beginning, because there was a need to create a uniform and even homogeneous culture, everybody needed to forsake the culture of their parents and grandparents right. from the countries. Yeah. Well, Ben-Gurion asked himself a very simple question. Uh, what do they have in common, all those newcomers? You know, he famously said, before statehood, we had uh, people without a land. Post-statehood, we have a land without people, and therefore we need to bring as many people as possible. Zionism was not a big hit. Most, Amer most world Jews were not Zionists. Um, pre-statehood and post-statehood. And so it was a real challenge to bring people. So Ben-Gurion said, what do they all have in common? The Jew from Poland and the Jew from Yemen and the Jew from Morocco, what do they have in common? And so he created Israeli statism, which the collective was at the heart of it, what you call the ethos of cohesion. Now, the argument which I'd like you to, re to comment about is that that ended with the introduction of mass media with the openness of Israeli culture to American culture, to Americanism that happened in the late 70s, early 1980s, especially with color TV, and then more forcefully with the introduction of the internet. It's all gone. And Israeli society became less interested in the collective in cohesion, more interested, like American society, in the individual. And do you see that reflection in the products of Israeli popular culture? like film and television? Uh, first of all, I'm uh, the underdog that believes in popular cinema. I don't think the best films or quality films or those films we export to film festivals or which win the Oscar are the films that represent uh, Israeli culture more than other films. I think Israeli culture and or the thing that binds Israelis together would be more Borekas films or the films that they choose to see again and again. Right. Um, and so what I think is, I'll use the term, uh, the cultural toolkit. The cultural toolkit is what you identify with, what comes to your mind when you're sad or when you're happy on, or on occasions. Um, so there used to be a shared and homogeneous cultural toolkit, and this is no longer the case. I think multiculturalism, more than just mass media, um, kind of divided the culture into subcultures. And so now we're in a situation where there is no consensus about what Israeli culture is. Right. Uh, now, as for Americanization, okay, the claim that it's a, it's a problem for Israeli culture, I don't think it is. I think if you watch, for example, and I hope you do, uh, reality TV's um, programs like uh, uh, Israeli Idol or um, The Next Star, Kohav Abba, or Kohav Nolad, okay, the, or ex, the Israeli X Factor, or the Israeli The Voice. What you see, for example, the judges there. Some represent Medita Mediterranean, uh, more Eastern or... Israeli music, some represent more Western rock inclined Israeli music, and both genres of music genuinely and faithfully represent Israeli music. Right. So Israeli music is no longer collective, no longer homogeneous. Uh, the, the culture actually reflects the fact that this is a multicultural culture. Right. And, and well, I think that one of the things that, um, and, and by the way, and I agree with you, Americanization is not necessarily good or bad. It's just uh, something that 
You know, it's um, it's culture. a dialogue. It's, it's an dialogue. intercultural. Exactly. I call it exchange. the cultural flow. Cultures flow from one place to another. Absolutely. Uh, but um, here is the thing that um, I, I, I'm curious to hear about about your opinion about that. So. The main argument is that Israeli film, and I remember as a, as a young, and I have two degrees in, in film studies. Wow. Um, Tell me about it. I remember, I remember. Where did you study being, film? I studied here at Tel Aviv U. Hmm. And I remember how embarrassing it was for me to watch Israeli movies. The dialogue was awkward. The, the the movies were horrible. Israeli filmmakers, without going into names, some of them were my teachers, just didn't know how to tell a good story. They were horrible filmmakers. And the reason is because they wanted to tell a political story. They spoke on behalf of a narrative, on behalf of a collective. They were part of that ethos of cohesion. Now, I see Israeli movies, and I'm just proud to see the young filmmakers that know how to tell a story. They don't, they don't have the pretension of carrying a national message behind them. It's just a good storytelling. And you see it with television shows like Fauda and Stissel, and, but you see it also in the big screen. And it's a big change. Do you see that change? Do you, do you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. And I describe it in my work, in my research. Um, first of all, I'd like to say something about the, how similar American and Israeli cultures are. And I think one of the reasons that, that there's so much impact of American culture, it's not only by imitating American culture, it's because the cultural conditions are very similar, are very much alike. They're both immigrant cultures. They're both not very traditional. They're avant-garde cultures that invented themselves. So I see the analogies and that's... What makes it easy for me to teach about Israeli culture in the United States? Uh, and Israeli cinema and television are very helpful for me in teaching about Israeli culture because Israeli culture is not political. It's only political in a sense, in what they call identity politics. Right. So my argument about current Israeli cinema and television is that it, at some point it began to be created from an authentic point of departure. So that when Shemi Zarchin, to mention a name, made films about Shlomi or about Aviva, they took place in the Tiberius that he knew right. firsthand. So that when uh, Dro Shaul made Sweet Mad or Adama Meshugat, it was about the kibbutz where he grew up. It right, came right. from a personal place. When right, by the way, Shlomi and Ronit El Kabetz made To Take a Wife, right. it came from their own home where they grew up. Right. By the way, in my in my diplomatic positions, I promoted many Israeli movies, and um, and I totally agree with you. the The turning point was somewhere in the 1980s. Absolutely. Where people like Shemi Zarchin and uh, Savi Gabizon, whom I studied with, and others, mm -hmm. and then of course television also, Hamishia Kamenet, like, and all those shows. Think now, of, of Shnot Hashmonim, the 80s. Yeah, Shalom and many a sayag about their youth and childhood. Right. Right. So let's. You mentioned humor now. Humor is very important. Uh, there's no question about it. I think the humor mainstreamed uh, Jews into American society. And, uh, and I think that humor has the potential of mainstreaming Israel into global culture. Uh, question is, um, I have friends in Hollywood, uh, big time producers, that were exposed to Israeli humor in particular I'll mention the parliament, which uh, some of my friends think that it's humor, a world class. It's even better than Seinfeld in terms of the sophistication of the humor. Uh, and of course, some parts of um, Eretz Nehderet, those of us uh, who don't know Eretz Nehderet, it means a wonderful country. It's a Israeli equivalent of SNL, Saturday Night Live. Um, Although I think the parliament is in a much higher level in terms of, of, the, of the writing. 
How do you translate that into a language? Because humor is not necessarily a global language. You have rare instances like Seinfeld, like Kirby Enthusiasm, where you know it, it speaks to many cultures. It's universal, right? In the case of, of Larry David, it's this neurosis that is universal. Everybody can relate to the, the, the pathology of the, of the personality of Larry David. But how do you translate Israeli humor that is so like the, the character of Shauli or the character of the, the Arab veterinarian? Let me, first of all, um, be a scholar for a minute and, and differentiate between humor and satire. And also, you know, there was a, in the 80s, in the early 80s, there was a research published under the title Israeli Humor. And uh, this was by Elliot Oring, and he studied the Israeli chil- chizbat, Yalkut Akzavim, which for me... And is, again, chizbat, for, the, for, the, for our listeners, is a tale. It's an exaggeration of a grain of truth. It's a story that you tell that really at one point detaches itself from reality. Exactly. But in Israeli culture, cultural history, it's a unique creation by the Palmach oral culture. These were tales told in the Kumzits near the bonfire, and and this was a an original Israeli invention. Now, take this. A, what Oring says is that all this humor is about differentiating between the Sabra and the more diasporic Jews, and its object of ridicule was the non-native Israeli. Although, they, although the non-native Israelis, were, shaped, they were all sh- non-native they shaped Israelis. Israeli culture. When you do it by Fraim Kishon again, exactly a world-class writer. Thank you. So I wanted to go to Salah Salah oh. Shabbati, all right, which is the bestseller. Israeli movie in Israel and an award-winning film, a very important film. Now, what's the point about Salah? Salah, uh, some scholars say, is ridiculed for being um, Mizrahi. But I say, no, Salah is Ephraim Kishon itself, himself, ridiculing veteran Israelis, kibbutzniks, for their bureaucracy. Salah is like the brave soldier Shweik or, yeah, right. or Forrest Gump. He exposes, he right. lays bare this... He's the conduit. He's the conduit to tell a story about the culture. And to criticize bureaucracy, ideology right. that's not By the way, I, I, I must say that... When I went to school here at Tel Aviv U in the early 1980s, that's when social criticism of Ephraim Kishon and Salah Shabbati as a character started by some researchers here in this university. And I never really, um, I never got it, and I never really agreed with it. I thought exactly what you're saying, that Salah actually is a very sophisticated uh, form of, of um, you know, criticizing society. So Salah was actually making fun of us, not the other way around. Exactly. And he was, rep- he represented bourgeois, materialistic, pragmatic um, values that have completely taken over Israeli right. culture. We should also explain to our listeners who are not familiar with Israeli culture, what Salah is all about. So if you can say a few words about the movie. Okay, it's about a new immigrant who in the 1950s comes to Israel and he struggles for a shikun, for an apartment to live because he's sent to a, a transit camp what they used to call Ma'abarot. Now... Um, so the big deal was housing. I, the, need, the big deal was everything. I need to tell everybody because they weren't 
regrettably, I was born already. I was very young, but I was born already. And, and I know firsthand what it was like when Israel was small before 67, when we ate only what grew on the trees and we were lucky during the austerity time in the 1950s. Israel, the state of Israel struggled to become the strong state that it is, but it was poor. Resources were poor. And so when these mass immigration into Israel from Europe post-World War II and from the Middle East, where Arab countries would not have Jews anymore because they were associated with the Zionism and the state of Israel. And Israel had to be the safe haven for all so, these... So Salah takes place right in, in the, the 1950s. In the middle of this process where Israel is growing through immigration, right? So from And, and transit pre, camps. Pre-statehood, we were 550,000 people here, then 800,000, and then 1.6 million. So the population doubled in eight years. Exactly. And most of the newcomers came from Arab countries from either North Africa or Central Asia, like Iraq and Syria. And, and so on. Egypt and Iraq, and Egypt. yes. And those immigrants and Libya and suffered Syria, a major Lebanon. cultural shock because they came from a place where they had an established life to a place that was practically, there was nothing here. There was no economy. There was a little bit of industry, a little bit of agriculture. The state of Israel had nothing to give them. And in that process, many families were crushed. Yes. So the point is they came from a traditional Jewish culture where the father... It's a, I'll use a feminist term, but it's true. It's a very patriarchal culture. Of There's course. a lot of respect to the father. Now, the father loses his status when he becomes somebody at the mercy of a government that will give him or not give him somewhere to live, some work to work that's not real, like planting trees. And, and you know, there was... A problem for people not only to make a living, but, you know, I think that the point when I went to live in the States for over a decade and was actually an immigrant there, although I spoke the language, I know the culture very well, it, when you are displaced from your culture and be, you become... Helpless for at this point, I thought it was such an important, humbling experience for me, right? A native Israeli to experience what to be in my father's skin because my father was an immigrant to Israel, right. he wasn't now, born in Israel. Would you say that the um, the immigrant experience is getting its fair share in Israeli popular culture today? I think it's 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 a mixture. Of, of this global world, we live in a world where many become immigrant willingly or unwillingly. There's a huge movement of populations. Now, think of it, it's absurd. There's so many uh, Israelis in Berlin, for example. Who would imagine? People used to not buy German pro products because of what oh, because of the, the Holocaust, right? Right. And now Israelis move to Berlin, to Manhattan, to, to they become farmers in Spain and whatnot. But so it's not only an Israeli thing, but it is also an Israeli thing. And if there was long ago an ethos of wanting to be a rooted Israeli that a sabra Okay, right. that's over. You can, uh, first of all, there's an ethos of you need to succeed wherever it is right. on the one hand. On the other... That's the American individualism. That's the American ethos. Yes. The American it, dream. The American dream. If you're willing to work hard and the sky's the limit, right? That's the American dream. Now, obviously, I know a lot of people that work very hard and didn't get any, you know, and got nowhere. But that the fact that it's there, it's a very, very compelling notion. 
It's the American dream. It's kind of a global, it's become a global dream. And uh, the old values that were collectivist, that were even ascetic, you know, it wasn't to live modestly and right. to share everything you have with others was a very dominant ethos. Now it's a, it's not, a, it's... It's, it's not there anymore. Now, before we, you know, I, our time is up, but but I wish I, I, I could speak with you for hours about this, oh, as you can tell. So could I but, with you. <laughs> but but for, for the benefit of our listeners and our viewers, um, could you recommend a few movies, television shows, books, songs that you think, um, you know, just to entice our audience's curiosity. For example, we mentioned the name Ephraim Kishon. I don't know how many people here are familiar with Ephraim Kishon, but I think that every Jew in the world uh, should be aware of his work. Uh, Dan Ben Amotz, who was erased by Israeli culture uh, for reasons that um, are not related to his actual work, is one of the people, whether we like it or not, who defined Israelism as we know it today, and he was not born here. You know, he came from Poland. Um, so very similar to American culture, where people like Don Rickles and and Red Buttons and all those guys defined American humor, and they were all newcomers or children of newcomers. So can you recommend some movies, books? Um, I'll say the following: uh, because uh, I taught in the United States for over the, a decade in the best like in very good university, like universities like the University of Wisconsin and Smith College and Wesleyan University and University of Miami. And I met many American students and uh, be, being exposed to Israeli cinema and television, whatever, gives you the portrait of Israel. It's very diverse and fascinating uh, kaleidoscopic culture. It's history. Whatever you read and see on television, and there's a lot on, on Netflix, there's Fauda, there's Stissel, there, the beauty queen of Jerusalem. Whatever you see of Israel will, will give you another angle another perspective because there's so it's a small country but i think it contains the dna of everything in the world in terms of culture it's east and west and secular and religious and many religions and many ethnicities it's very so israel is a, is a is a beautiful blend that produces a very eclectic uh, cultural content and 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 I, you know, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation with you because I think you touched upon so many important things and you really um, stimulated the curiosity of our audience. And, and what I really would like people to do after they listen to this is to go online and search after all those things that you mentioned, all those cultural gems that exist out there and for people to celebrate. So thank you so much, Dr. Thank Talmon. You. Thank you, Ido. And I Dr. hope... To, <laughs> well, I, I wish I was a doctor. I'm not a doctor yet. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for being here and I'd like to reserve the opportunity to invite you again. Thank you. And I'd until the next come. time, Greetings to all of our listeners and viewers from Tel Aviv. Shalom. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomats.